Well, as an astronaut, I think I can answer that question. It's not. One of my favorite uh, poets is a guy by the name of Emmett Potts. He says, your heart's desire is the voice of God, and that voice must be obeyed sooner or later. You know, as an astronaut, I know you came here to listen to me talk about my space exploits, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But I think the most important message that I have to deliver to you today is this one. That you are an infinite being with infinite possibilities. That point that I talked about, that voice that was so critical early on, it was critical for me. Uh, I found my voice in the heavens. I used to, uh, when I was a child, uh, look up at the heavens at night and wonder what those stars represented. Uh, were they simply stars and other suns? And were they planets? And if they were planets, what would it be like to actually go to one of those planets? And, uh, you know, I actually had that answer, or that question answered, with this photo. When I was 13 years old, NASA was in a race with the Russians to see who was going to get to the uh, moon first. And I saw Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin land on the moon. And I heard those fabulous words, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And it was not only a giant leap for mankind, but for this little boy to look at that black and white television. Do you guys even know what that is, black and white television? Oh, things are changing. And to imagine myself following in their footsteps uh, was somewhat of a leap of faith. But you know, I was uh, no different than any American kid, in fact, any kid of the world, when we looked at those pictures and we saw, for the first time, human beings leaving this planet and going to another planet. Yes, the moon is another planet caught in the orbit of the Earth. But when I saw that, it opened my eyes. And so I set off on a course to you know, do the educational things that you just heard about and eventually landed at NASA in 1990 as part of the 13th class in the astronauts. As an astronaut, uh, we go through two years of basic training where we learn how to fly jets and we learn how to survive in different environments. Uh, we also uh, learn how to fly the shuttle. And of course, I went as a mission specialist and we learned all sorts of experiments and things like that up in space, and I'll share a little bit of that with you in a minute. Uh, get into space uh, these, those days, because we had changed a little bit. I flew on Discovery and Columbia, but I remember my first flight very distinctly. Uh, I remember walking up to the launch tower on that day and standing at the base of the launch tower and rising before me 200 feet in the air was the space shuttle Columbia. And we got uh, all of us into the elevator, we went all the way up to about the 150 foot level, and we went one by one into the vehicle. And I remember as the suit technicians got us into the vehicle and were laying on our backs, and I remember the shuttle door closing as we were all now ready to go. And when that door closed, there was this hiss pss, as they were pressurizing the vehicle. And it was at that moment that I questioned my dream. It kind of went like this. <laughs> what in the hell am I doing here? <laughs> and I knew at that moment that there was uh, nothing I could do. They had locked the vehicle from the outside, and there was no way of getting out. So I was going to be you know, along for the ride, no matter what that ride is. And what a ride it was. You've seen the shuttle lift off many times before, but you may not know that it weighs 5 million pounds. In order to get that 5 million pounds in the air, like five engines that produce a thrust of seven and a half million pounds. And when uh, those babies light, uh, you're leaving this planet and nothing's going to hold you to it. It's an incredible ride as you get catapulted into the sky. By the time we get two minutes into the liftoff, we're at 100,000 feet above the ground. At that point, we're going to mere 2,500 miles an hour. And now we're above most of the atmosphere, so there's nothing holding us back. No resistance on the vehicle. And we go over the next six and a half minutes from 2,500 miles an hour to 5,000 to 10,000 to 15,000, eventually to 17,500 miles an hour. At 17,500 miles an hour, you go from being pushed back in your seat to 
three and a half G's, about three and a half times your weight, just multiply that with the mathematician. And you will realize how heavy it is. But you go from that sensation to zero gravity just like that, and everything begins to float. And I remember a kind of funny story. I was so enamored. I'm sitting in my seat, still buttoned up, and, and I took off my glove, and when I took my glove off, it kind of got away from me, and it went kind of tossing, going off, and I realized I'm in zero gravity. Incredible to see that. And then I took my other glove off, and I just, in this case, it wasn't an accident, I did it on purpose, just to see what would happen. And I realized, after a few minutes, as I looked around, and the other guys that were flying next to me, that they were out of their seats, and they were on, and I was going, oh, wait a minute, you know, because I'm a rookie, you know, I, I was just kind of experimenting, for my own little experiment. So finally, I reached down, and I grabbed my my buckle or my seat belt and I unbutton it and then you know the suit technicians had squeezed this in so tightly that by the time I released the, the buckle I sprung out like toast out of a toaster and I lost control and I was kicking switches and hitting this and that and I realized what happened those guys realized that they were sitting next to a rookie and they were getting the hell out of the way before I got it but once I got my space legs our arms and then I went out and I put my hand on the window sills and I got a beautiful view of my head. It was incredible to see that. Just incredible. These days, of course, we are, we are transition. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. So the big thing these days, of course, is we're going to the International Space Station. As an astronaut and as a mission specialist, I had two main jobs. So my first job was to be the physician. So I was the guy taking care of the crew on board. And so when someone got sick, they came to me. I actually like to refer to being a physician as that I like being a physician because I get to take care of them and I get to dish it out and not take it. Uh, I get to poke and rod on them and see how it changes. So a lot of changes go on in the human body and that was my job to figure that out. I actually use that knowledge that I have uh, gain of being an astronaut and what I do now. I run a venture capital firm where we focus in telemedicine. So I'm taking that knowledge and that experience and now translate it into investing in entrepreneurs that are involved in healthcare. My other job was even more funner. Is that a word I know we're on academic second sentence? Yeah. I'll use that. Word. Anyway, and that was to go outside and do a spacewalk. On my second flight, I got a chance to go to the Mir space station, and part of that activity was also to do a six-hour spacewalk. I donned this 350-pound suit and went outside for the very first time. It was incredible. I got lifted up, arm of the, the robotic arm above the payload bay. I got a nice view of the crew down below in the space shuttle, and they were waving at me through it window and I was waving at them and behind them of course was the beautiful planet Earth and of course behind that was the sea of stars. It was incredible to be part of that. My experience as an astronaut allowed me to see other wonders like this, and that is Aurora Borealis, Northern Lights. It was incredible. I have to share this other story with you. One night I was on the flight deck and we actually fly the shuttle upside down to the Earth. So I got a nice picture of the Earth down below, but then ahead in the front windows, I saw this light on the horizon. And just for a minute, it was just a, just a twinkle on the horizon. And I thought just for a minute that, you know, I might have been able to answer that question I always get asked by people. I said, Dr. Harris, you've been in space. Have you seen any aliens? Because I thought, for the first time, that might be a spaceship from another planet. Well, it turned out it wasn't, of course. It was the beginning of Northern Lights. And so as we got closer, the Northern Lights got bigger and bigger and just filled the entire cockpit of light. It was so beautiful. You could see this, uh, these, these lights extending way above the shuttle and all the way down to the ground. It was beautiful. And this picture, unfortunately, doesn't do uh, that uh, very much justice. In space, we get a chance to see a lot of the Earth in that when we travel at 17,500 miles per hour, we go around the world every 90 minutes. We 
get to see a sunset or sunrise every 45 minutes. It's incredible, incredible. And I would like to show, if I can, if this works, a sunrise from space. As the sun comes up, it will, within a few seconds, peak from, from this little, you know, peak above the horizon to full blown in about the time in which I just described that peak from the horizon comes to full blown, about five to six seconds. And the temperature will go from a minus 165 degrees to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It's incredible to have that experience. I also put this slide in here to not only share with you the, the experience of the, my space travel, but as a transition, many people know that, that we are moving toward the, the, the next level in space exploration. And so you've probably seen this on television about SpaceX and Boeing, and so this next generation is not only going to take cargo up to the International Space Station, uh, but we're actually going to be taking crew within about two years. And so uh, this is exciting because for the first time we're going to have private industry with private money engaged in building the next generation uh, spaceships. And this is where true innovation begins. And so I'm looking forward to that. This will also be the platform in which we'll use to go back to the moon. And this time, not just to put a flag on the surface and leave footprints, but we actually will have habitat modules. And one of my dreams as a kid, when I, especially after I decided to be a doctor, was that I said, one day I'm gonna hang out my shingle on this habitat module that says Bernard Harris, MD. It's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. Maybe not for me, but for some of you who are in the audience today, you'll get a chance to do that. When we get our lunar legs together, then we'll go on to Mars, the big prize. Now, a lot of people ask me, why Mars? Why are we so concerned about Mars? Because when you look at the planets in our solar system, it is the one that we can probably uh, survive on. All the others are either too cold or they're too hot. And some scientists say that Mars at one point in time had an atmosphere that was very similar to ours and that some sort of catastrophe caused the atmosphere to be blown away and you have what's left today, a barren planet that is a daytime temperature of my, uh, around minus 60 degrees, high winds, but it is survival, it does have an atmosphere. And you've probably seen in the newspapers the talk about sending uh, a married couple up into space and then there's also a competition that's going on right now about uh, people competing to go, go to Mars. And uh, so it'll, it is a, a dream of humankind to be there. Um, and then you'll, this is the artist's rendition of what it might look like on Mars. We certainly would have to have a pressure suit or at least a partial pressure suit to, to be there. Then after Mars, a big question is, what is next? I love this slide taken by the Hubble. It actually is an amalgamation of different shots taken in different parts of our universe. The universe as we know it is infinite. And when we take a look, it's amazing to me to reflect back to being a little kid looking up at the heavens at those, uh, those lights, being able to find some of those lights as spiral galaxies like our Milky Way galaxy or other galaxies. If Carl Sagan was here, he would be talking about the millions and millions of galaxies that are out there that make up our known universe. If uh, Albert Einstein was here, we'd be talking about how this whole universe is extending into nothingness. Nobody really knows. So that question about is the sky, you know, if the, what if the sky isn't the limit? I think we've answered it through, through science. One day, we'll take this vehicle that you might have seen about, or heard about, or read about, uh, and this is the new heavy launch vehicle, vehicle, vehicle that was bigger than the Saturn V that will launch us back to the moon and to Mars and to the moon. And when I see stuff like this, I really, really get excited about the possibilities. The possibilities of us going to 
other worlds, leaving our solar system, and finally you know, being able to hopefully develop that Star Trek kind of technology where we can go warp speed and get from, you know, just be able to travel with within our own galaxy, but perhaps looking out. You know, I guess I'm just kind of crazy that way. My what if is what if we had technology to leave our galaxy and go out and to really explore into the outer reaches of the universe. So, I've just shared with you kind of what I call my extraterrestrial mission. That extraterrestrial mission led me to two space shuttle missions, led me to the Mir space station, allowed me to work as a scientist in preparing the astronauts who are on board the station right now and those who are in preparation for going to Mars and your asteroids, you name it, they're, they're doing it. That's our extraterrestrial mission. But I have another mission, and that mission is a terrestrial one. And that mission is to come back and to talk to audiences like yourself. And I particularly like the little ones. So we created the Harris Foundation that is involved with trying to inspire young folks about fulfilling their dreams. And so I'm going to treat you right now, and I hope you bear with me, just like I would my elementary group. Okay, you guys ready for that? I know you're college students, and you know, it might be a little difficult for you, but kind of bear with me. One of the things we, we do is we ask them to repeat that phrase that I showed you at the very beginning, and actually put, make it more personalized. And it goes like this, I'm an infinite being with infinite possibilities. So I want you guys to repeat after me. You ready for this? All right, I know it's the end of the day, but I think you can do it. So repeat after me, I am an infinite being with infinite possibilities. Now, every time I ask people to say that, they always sound like this. I am an infinite being with infinite possibilities. Oh God, is he gonna ask me to do it again? <laughs> Guess what? I'm gonna ask you to do it again. But this time I want you to, you know, put a little bit more, you know, <clears throat> in it, you know? <laughs> Here we go. I am an infinite being with infinite possibilities. Now let me tell you what that means. It means that each and every one of you in this room was born multi-potential with the ability to do anything that you want to do in life. Anything. I know it's been said earlier that many of you are trying to figure out what it is that you want to do. Know that, number one, that you can do anything you want. You're multi-potential. Number two, it means that you are born multi-talented, that there are skills in which you have come into this world, and it's up to you to figure out what those skills are. And then you can use something, I know this might be foreign to college students, called a brain, this gift. That's why you're here. That you can learn other skills and talents that add to those skills that you were born with. And number three, which I believe is the most important message that I can deliver to you today because it's the message that, that I got when I was young and that I continue to reinforce not only within myself, but not only within, within my daughter, but also within people that I engage with, that you were born for a reason. There is something special. There is something or some things that you're supposed to do. I discovered what, what that is. And it's up to you to figure out what, what that is. And guess what? If you don't figure that out, if you don't do it, it's not just a loss to you, but we lose your gift that you have to give to the world. So find that voice. This is your opportunity to find that voice. And I guarantee you, if you find that voice, there is nothing that's going to stop you from accomplishing your dream and be successful. So I'm getting in with this picture. It's a beautiful picture of not me, unfortunately, my space walk, but Bruce McCallis, who was the first human being to take a jet pack and actually buzz it out away from the space shuttle and have beautiful pictures of the space shuttle for the very first time many years ago. And we have this picture of him just hanging out in space. I like this picture because it makes or embodies in this one photograph 
the power of the individual, the power of the dream, the power of, in of innovation, and more importantly, the, the power of inspiration that we all have inside of us. So, my charge to you is to find your place and make a difference in this world. Thank you very much. And go Tech!